Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm going to be discussing the language of gender sensitivity. Just an overview of what we're going to cover. I'm going to be talking about the difference between sex and gender, touching briefly on the disorders of sex development, and the bulk of the talk will focus around sexual and gender minorities and the terminology we apply to them. Then also just to bring it all together, why it's important for us to know the barriers that these patients face in healthcare and how we should approach them in our own practice. So starting out with sex versus gender, the chromosomal sex, or more specifically the presence or absence of the Y chromosome, determines gonadal sex. Gonadal sex, in turn, determines the hormonal environment which directs the development of internal and external genitalia in the embryo and secondary sex characteristics during puberty. Sex is assigned at birth, usually by the birth attendant, and usually based solely on the appearance of the external genitalia. There are, of course, exceptions and diversions from this pattern, and therefore cases where sex cannot be so easily determined. These arise where individuals have either extra or missing sex chromosomes, or in those where the gonads fail to stimulate the hormonal environment required to allow sexual development. These are collectively known as the disorders of sex development, and they're previously referred to as intersex conditions. Individuals in this group have variations in internal and external anatomy as well as in the sex hormones. And the intersex characteristics may be visibly apparent at birth, but in some cases they can only be identified through genetic testing. Gender doesn't refer to biological characteristics. Rather, it is one's internal identification in relation to the social constructs of male or female. The World Health Organization defines gender as the socially constructed characteristics of women and men, such as norms, roles and relationships of and between groups of men and women. It varies from society to society and can be changed. While some may argue that these roles are inherently based in biology, power and control can have a significant impact on the role functions assigned to each gender. Instead, gender should be defined according to the number of aspects, and this is where the terminology gets complicated. The notion of gender identity is at the very core of our being and defines who we are, how we're seen by the world around us, and the way we express ourselves through behaviours, characteristics and thoughts. But gender identity is much more than the sex you're assigned at birth. Gender is not as simple as anatomy. Many people have mixed anatomy in some way. Though they're often used interchangeably, the terms gender and sex are not the same thing. Some people have never identified with the social gender norms associated with their birth and sex. A person who has always identified with the opposite sex's gender roles may identify as transgender. The term cisgender describes people whose gender identity matches their biological sex. While we tend to think of gender as being very binary, in other words male and female, not everyone fits into those neat little categories. Some people don't identify with either male or female and may use terms like gender queer, gender fluid or non-binary to describe themselves. Some cultures have distinct roles for non-binary individuals, sometimes described as a third gender. For example, certain North American indigenous groups who use the term two-spirit. And although the term two-spirit is modern, the concept of a third gender is not within that cultural group. Being transgender or any other non-cis gender is an identity, not a mental illness. However, gender dysphoria is a condition arising from the distress of being in the wrong body in a highly gendered society. That diagnosis isn't universally accepted as valid, however, it is part of the DSM-5. Gender expression refers to external displays related to gender and is not necessarily congruent with gender identity. Someone may cross-dress, including as a performance persona, for example, a drag queen, without identifying as the gender they're dressing as. Transgender individuals' gender expression choices may be influenced by the discrimination they expect to face if their gender expression matches their true gender identity rather than their biological sex. In these cases, if hormone therapy isn't started early, it becomes more and more difficult to pass as one's identified gender. So, sex derives from biology, and gender derives from social constructs. 
But what about sexuality? It sometimes gets mixed in with sex and gender, but is in fact its own distinct phenomenon. Who a person wants to sleep with doesn't necessarily have anything to do with their biology or the gender that they identify with. The fact that someone is transgender has no bearing on whether their sexual preference is for men, women, both, or neither. Sexual orientation comprises three different domains of every person's experience. Sexual identity, behavior, and romantic or emotional attraction. These three domains have distinct health correlates which research has shown may not all line up. One study noted that 25% of adult lesbian identified women were having sex with assumed cisgender men, highlighting the difference between sexual orientation and sexual behavior, and having obvious implications around pregnancy planning and contraception, among other considerations. Whereas sexual behaviors inform STI risk screening, or whether to proceed with a colpoclesis for prolapse, considerations of sexual identity help clinicians understand social support networks, durable power of attorney or partner benefits, and legal documents required at birth. Attraction may also be particularly relevant to discussions around sexual arousal dysfunction. The familiar term LGBTQ is now being replaced with the more inclusive umbrella term sexual and gender minorities. SGM includes everyone who is not cisgender. In other words, anyone whose gender identity does not align with the sex assigned at birth and who are not straight. Many people who might have been traditionally overlooked or excluded by the LGBTQ banner now fit comfortably under the SGM umbrella, including those who are asexual, pansexual, agender, genderqueer, gender non-binary, two-spirit, to name but a few. Another fundamental thing to appreciate that se is that sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex assigned at birth are different components of people's lives and need to be considered separately. Due to long-standing discrimination and stigma, SGM people have health disparities and are less likely to get the health care they need. Numerous studies have shown that SGM people are less likely to obtain necessary preventative care, present later for diagnosis and treatment, face discrimination, stigma, neglect, and poor treatment in doctor's offices, as well as having to teach their healthcare workers how to take care of them. This is true throughout all spheres of healthcare, including sexual and reproductive care. Gender diverse persons frequently face stigma and discrimination in society and in healthcare settings, and as a result, they're put at greater risk for physical and sexual violence and have an increased risk of mental and physical ill health. Some of the barriers they struggle with include those relating to confidentiality and disclosure of their gender identity and sexual preference, discrimination by staff, limited access to healthcare and insurance, as well as limited understanding by healthcare practitioners. SGM individuals are known to be at greater risk of STIs, especially HIV, psychosocial issues and mental illness, substance abuse, cancer, obesity, and challenges and discrimination regarding family formation. Having discussed the difference between sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex assigned at birth, it is important to understand how these domains are both distinct and overlapping features of our patients' experiences. These components can also be coupled with other aspects of experience and identity, such as someone's age, race, ethnicity, education, socioeconomic status, religion, geographic region, family structure, to name but a few. In thinking about how all these components interact, we start to appreciate the importance of one's gender and sexual orientation in their health as a part of the layers of complexity and the beauty of an SGM person's life. So how to get started in patient care in the SGM community? Dr. Juno Oberdin Malever has coined two simple frameworks to educate other healthcare providers about caring for SGM patients. He calls them the three principles and the four doors. Principle one, SGM people are different from cisgender or straight people. It's important to note that SGM disproportionately experience health disparities and resiliencies that manifest in different risk factors and health outcomes. An example here is that a cisgender lesbian woman and a transgender man 
are less likely to be up to date on pap smears. And in the case of a transgender man, the pap smear is likely to be insufficient more often than a cisgender woman. Cancer rates may also be higher, but this is difficult to quantify because most cancer registries do not collect such information and we are therefore limited in our understanding. Depression, anxiety, substance use, cardiometabolic risk factor differences, self-reported health and well-being, obesity, diabetes and asthma rates are all different between the SGM population and non-SGM people. According to the minority stress theory, living and moving in the world as an SGM person in a socio-cultural landscape that is designed for cisgender and straight people can be difficult. This results in poor health. From infancy on, gender is assumed to be consistent with one's sex assigned at birth, and it is assumed that people of one sex will be attracted to those of the other. Principle 2. SGM people are the same as cisgender or straight people. Despite different experiences of moving through the world, fundamental medical principles, biology and anatomy still apply to SGM people. Therefore, if someone has an organ, cancer screening should continue. The mantra, if you have it, screen it, should always apply. All the services that an obstetrician, gynecologist and other reproductive or sexual health expert provides will be needed and should be made accessible to SGM people. These include, but are not limited to, routine preventative gynecological care, treatment for pelvic, vulva, vaginal pathology, infertility treatment, full-spectrum family planning including contraception, abortion, preconception, perinatal and postpartum care, breast or chest feeding support, cancer screening and treatment, and infectious disease screening and treatment. Principle number three. SGM people are unique and different from one another. What one bisexual cisgender woman wants for support around sexual dysfunction may be very different from what another bisexual cisgender woman wants. To carry this further, just because one transgender man wants a hysterectomy and bilateral salpingoophorectomy as part of his gender affirmation, does not mean that all transgender men desire the same surgery. As has been shown by a United States transgender survey of over 27,000 participants. Being SGM is one aspect of people's lives. It is not determinative. Many other aspects of their lives and identities such as race, ethnicity, education, class, geography, native and preferred languages, partnership, religion, family structure and employment, to name a few, are also critical to consider as they interact with care decisions, resources and needed services. The concept of the four doors helps clinicians think about how to create an accessible and safe clinical practice for SGM people. Door number one, what happens when you get in the door? Good patient care starts before a patient ever sees a healthcare provider. In a, in a vulnerable time of seeking healthcare, being respectfully treated and feeling welcome goes a long way to helping establish a good clinical rapport that can lead to a healing interaction. Having a physical environment that affirms the personhood of all patients is very important. This means signage that reflects that people of different genders need obstetric and gynecological care, magazines that show different types of parents and partnerships, and posters that show different families. And this also means having bathrooms that are for people of any gender. Door number two, what happens behind closed doors? In other words, what happens between you and the patient? Interactions with clinicians are central to the care experience. Learning how to ask about people's lives, including their sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex assigned at birth in sensitive ways will enhance a therapeutic rapport. It may be easier or less awkward to ask this information on a pre-visit questionnaire, or you may prefer to exclusively ask these questions in a clinical interview. These questions, however, should not be shied away from and are critical to supporting accurate and evidence-based medical care. Door number three. What happens between doors? Often patients will need to be referred to other providers, and these providers may not have implemented the steps you have to support SGM people in their practice. Patients view people we refer them to as extensions of our relationship with them. If they have a bad experience with another provider, it may not only undermine therapeutic goals, but also your relationship with that patient. Therefore, calling ahead, noting with permission, the SGM status to the referring provider and following up with your patients about their experiences can go a long way. Door number four. What happens to get people in the door? In other words, thinking about getting SGM people as a sought-out population to serve and have expertise in. 
For many healthcare providers, supporting SGM people may not only be a necessary component of providing excellent care to a broad swath of population, but also a way to grow their practice. What questions should we ask and how? This is a very important part of making a safe space for SGM patients. Always ask their chosen name and preferred pronoun. Respectfully ask how he or she or they would like to be addressed. Only ask appropriate questions. Don't assume the sexual orientation of an SGM patient as it can change over their lifetime. If you make a mistake, apologize and swiftly move on to the appropriate response. And when seeing these patients with general complaints, be careful of the transgender broken arm syndrome. Just a note on gender specific pronouns, he, she, his or hers, these are the specific ways that we refer to each other in the third person. People who are transitioning in some way might choose to change their pronouns and prefer the use of gender neutral pronouns or gender fluid. These would include they, them or their and there have also been newer terms coined z, c, zai and here. Most importantly, when speaking with these patients, if ever unsure, ask, respect, and practice. These are just a few questions and suggested answer fields when um, encountering an SGM patient and how to phrase your questions during your interview or possibly in your questionnaire in a safe and non-judgmental space. Just one final point to cover is the ethical and moral principles. All patients deserve to be treated the same way and therefore the basic ethics principles apply and no patient should ever be denied care because of conflicts with the practitioner's moral, cultural or religious. Providing care that is open, accepting, supportive and when needed to tailor to the SGM community is the action that is needed now to help eliminate critical health disparities. We can achieve this by increasing our awareness, expanding our knowledge base and tweaking our already existing scope of practice.